And if you will take that Bible and you will turn with me to Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Got a little bit of scripture to read. We're going to go from 13 to 34. Bear with me. But this is a, a really good piece of scripture this morning to help us understand the goodness of God. As Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 13. And all God's people there, somebody say amen. Yeah. Um, Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat. Drink. Be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens, they do not sow or reap, they have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds? Who are you by worry and can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the lilies grow, they do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O oh you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where no thief comes near or no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Father God, I ask that you would help me preach this, teach this, talk about this, share your word. Very well-known piece of scripture. Would you give it to us fresh? Would you show us how awesome and good you are? And how we can trust you in everything. And how you've proven to be trustworthy time and time and time again. Guide us, teach us, encourage us. And when it's all said and done, let Jesus shine. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Um, I started a sermon series some weeks ago about God being good. I just felt led to begin to start bragging on God. We've been talking about, we say it, I've been saying it for years, God is good, and everybody says all the time. I mean, we know and as believers in Christ that God is good. But sometimes the things that are so obvious, that are so good about God, we take for granted and we miss it. And because of that, we know he's good, but we don't really remember, you know, why he's good, right? So I felt led to start preaching on God being good and the things that make him good. This morning, I want to preach on something that we're all familiar with, something that we take for granted. And just hopefully, somehow, in the midst of unpacking the goodness of God inside this scripture, we could leave here just a little bit more encouraged, just a little bit more uh, uh, of an understanding of how good he really is. 
Probably half of this sermon is just going to be bragging on God. Can I brag on God for a little while? I mean, we brag on ourselves a whole lot. It's, it's time sometimes. Sometimes it's good to stop and just, just let me show you how good he is. In ways that we don't, we, 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 after I say it, you're going to be like, oh yeah. But unless someone says it, you don't think about it. Like, we know God is good because he's our provider, right? Everybody in here understands that if you are a follower of Jesus, if, if you have any bit of faith that 2,000 years ago, Jesus rose from the dead, if you believe even it that much, you have to understand that God is our provider. That everything you have, everything that you've ever had, and anything that you're ever going to have again is provided for by him. No matter how hard you work, no matter how little you work, no matter what lot in life you've had, if you have it, He is the provider. Amen? It comes from Him. And, and I'm so thankful for that because He's been so good to fulfill His promise to do just that. It's not just knowing that He is our provider. It's stopping for a minute and looking at what you have, looking at the state that your life is in, and realize that it's that way because of Him. For example, in this scripture, Jesus has promised that if anyone would seek first his kingdom, that we wouldn't have to worry about food and we wouldn't have to worry about clothing and, and we wouldn't have to worry about our basic needs. Now, you may worry about it, but technically speaking, Jesus has already fulfilled that promise in everybody's life in here. I was sitting here and I'm thinking about it. And I'm like, can I actually say that? Yeah. Everyone in here has been so blessed by God that you don't even see it sometimes. 2,000 years ago, Jesus said this and he kept his promise for everyone in here because everyone ate this week. Everyone has eaten their whole life. He has provided for us food above and beyond what we truly and really deserve. Our biggest problem this week is not going to be if we eat. Our problem this week is going to be what and how much? We, has anyone in here ever been on a diet? Show of hands if you've ever had to go on a diet. Is anybody on a diet now? You know what that means? He's kept his promise so much, you eat more than you need. You have so much, you have to push the food away. God has been good. I know he's been really, really good to me. There was a time in my life I was 258 pounds, size 44 waist. I was huge, and I had to go on a diet because God had blessed me so much I didn't know what to do with it, so I ate it all. <laughs> God has been good. We have, we have so much. Now, I understand that some of us have more than others. And there's been time in my life that I had less than I have now. And there's time in life that I had more than I had now. That it comes and it goes. But I've always had. I've always been able to go ever since I got married. No matter how, no matter how poor we were, my refrigerator was never empty. Ever. And I believe that for everybody in this room. I'm looking at you. Now there's been some times you might have had to scrape together a meal but you had that meal and you need to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, that I need to go on a diet because you've been just so good to me. Even when we weren't seeking his kingdom. Even when we were living for ourselves. Even when we weren't paying attention to him. Because everything we have comes from where? From him. And I want to say God is good because he has already provided. If he stops tomorrow and he cuts off the flow, we should still say thank you, Lord, because you gave me more than I deserve. You've given me more than I need. How many people have ever been to the refrigerator and opened it up and it has food in it? You just didn't want anything that was in it. Have you ever opened your refrigerator? I know I have, and, and I'm shaming, I'm being honest, and I know I'm not the only one. But I open the free freezer, and there's a ribeye steak, and there's some ribs, and there's some chicken, and there's boneless chicken, there's chicken with the bone in it, there's a whole chicken. I mean, I, I had pork, I had pork chops, I had everything, and I was like, I got nothing to eat. <laughs> I just got nothing. Look at Janelle, you want to go get Chinese? And we actually left. 
Kids are like that too. You know your children are. How many people had kids walking around? There ain't nothing ever to eat in this place. I just got to brag on God because we don't look at it that way. And we need to. We need to look at it and say, Lord God, thank you. Isn't that why we say grace before we eat? Before we put food in our mouth, we're saying thank you, Lord, for what you've given us. This, this comes from you, and I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. I mean, God is good. And all the time, God is good. He doesn't just provide our food, but what else has he provided? In this scripture, he's provided the clothes that he's promised. Everybody right now is wearing clothes. Thank you. Especially you, Marvin. Thank you very much. Last thing we need is Marvin to be losing his mind up in the sanctuary. You'll know it because Beverly will be sitting all up over here right here. We all have something to wear. Now, I understand there's times I've had more and there's times I've had less. And I understand that some people in here have more expensive clothes than others. But we all have clothes. There's been times in my life where I shopped at a store. And there's times in my life that I've been in the goodwill. I mean, it, it comes, it goes, it's up, it's down. But I never, me personally, never had to wear the same shirt and same shorts three, four days in a row. If I wore it twice, it's because I was too lazy to get something else out of the drawer. And it was before I was married. <laughs> Come on, guys. How many of you guys in here before you met someone, you had no problem just putting it on again? And then you met her. And all of a sudden, it started to matter, right? I walked in my closet at times, just staring at stuff. Couldn't decide, because I just had too much to choose from. Just too much. And I have a lot. I have a lot of shirts. Over the years as a pastor, I've always felt this need to, to make sure that I, I look appropriate up here, right? And as the times have gone, the culture's changed, what you wear up here changes. So every time I went on vacation, any time we went on a retreat, when Jan and I, we would buy a shirt. I have so many. I, I, she has to pull them out for me now because I can't. I'm just looking and which one do I wear? It's a good problem to have, isn't it? Because it tells me that God has given me more than I deserve. That God is really, really good. And, and listen, if you're not in that place and you still have something, you, you have something to wear on your body every day, that's not going to be a problem. Praise God. Thank Him. He kept His promise. You have food and you have clothing and you have shelter. We all have a place to live, don't we? Now, some of you have bigger places than others, and some of you have smaller places than others, but we all have a place to put our head. I was sitting in the house the other day during a storm, and a tree is blowing, and limbs are falling down, and, and I'm sitting in the living room nice and comfortable on my chair, thanking the Lord that the church has provided me such a wonderful place to be. My own little place. Does that make sense? Your home. Your kitchen, your bedroom, your yard, your living room, yours. God has been so good to give that to you and to make that, make that available to you. And God is good because he's promised to do it and he's kept his promise. We have it. And I'm thankful for it. And he doesn't just provide food, clothing, and shelter. What about the comforts in life that we have? The things that he didn't actually promise to give us, but he's given us anyway, the comforts, right? Like air conditioning. The very fact that you could be cold in here, praise God. Because the next thing you know, I'm going to hear how hot you are in here. Th thank you, Lord, for the heat in the winter and the air conditioner in the cold. I appreciate it. You have been good because it's hot out there. I shut it off. <laughs> Janan loves and actually I can't just say Janan Janan and I love our bed oh we bought this bed some time ago it was a king size bed with the pillow top just the right firmness for us oh she gets in that bed every morning like what in, every night like what in the world just happened and when we go on vacation we can't wait to get home 
to get inside of our bed. Am I the only one? Thank you, God, for my bed. And I have to, I have to be honest. Some of these things, Janan said, don't share those things. They're going to judge you. <laughs> but I'm like, well, don't judge me because you've got stuff that I don't have. You know, like I have my own special pillow. Does anyone have their own special custom made pillow so you can go to sleep? So a little kid already. Oh, that's bad. <laughs> Why would you at the age of 10 need a pillow? I mean, seriously, when I was in the Marine Corps, I used to sleep on a cot, roll up my jeans and my trousers, and, and that's how I would sleep right there on the floor. Now I can't sleep unless the bed has a pillow top and it has down down pillow, and a king-size pillow. I got to take it with me. Do you take your pillow everywhere you go there, Miller? You see? You see? Oh, you spoil that little kid. If anybody needs to be thankful, Miller, say, thank God. I'm going to hear it real loud. Thank you, Lord, that I'm 10 and I got my own special pillow. 12, all right, still the same thing. <laughs> He's been good to us. He's been generous. There's one more, there's one more. I don't know if you relate to it, but um, I'm thankful for my TV. I'm a little addicted to TV. You, you don't like, it has to be on. I don't like quiet. And over the years, I've acquired more than one. I have one in every room right now. I do. I, I didn't start that way. I bought one TV. A few years went by. There was a sale. It was bigger than that one TV. So I bought another TV. Now I have two. So I took the one and I put it in the bedroom and I have one in the living room. A few years go by. There's a bigger one came out. High definition comes out, right? Got all these bells and whistles. It's Christmas time. It's on sale. You buy another one. So now you got one in the living room, one in the bedroom, and you got one in the den. And then the den turns into the, you end up with the, now that I moved here, I got a man cave. I never had a man cave, but I have one now. Got a TV in it. And it's got cable. And it's not, I don't pay for all this. My, my, I, have, I pay for Netflix. And all my kids use my Netflix. My, my daughter pays for Amazon Prime. And we all use Amazon Prime. My son pays for Hulu. And we all use Hulu. And just recently, I don't know why or how, but we ended up with, with HBO Max or something like that. And so I have Netflix, HBO uh, uh, Amazon Prime, YouTube, and cable, and I still can't find anything to watch on TV. Now you could say, wow, Pastor, you got some stuff. Let me go in your garage, guys. Let me look at some of them power tools that you got stuck up in there. I've seen some of you guys driving around with that lawnmower that would so fancy. What do, you, what do you say, Michaela? Fancy. That's fancy. This is a fancy lawnmower. He's been good to us. Now, he's been good more to some, and some have less, and some have others. He never said we're all going to have the same. He just said, you're not going to have to worry about it because I'm going to provide it for you, and he has. And we need to leave here thanking him for providing us all that stuff. See, but here's the rub. Here's where it, it, it shifts. Isn't there more to life than just the possessions that we have? I mean, I appreciate my possessions, all right? Like, I, I, I do enjoy the house. I do enjoy the bed. And me and Miller and I, we enjoy our pillow. And, and we're going to continue to enjoy that pillow. But there's more to life than your pillow. There's more to life than what you eat. There's more to life than your television and your home. Jesus says that here. And I think if you've been around a while, you're wise enough to see that also. Things like relationships in the kingdom of God. See, God provides them too. And I believe relationships in the kingdom of God are more important than anything that you're ever going to have. And I say that because would you rather have everything in this world and no one? No friend, no wife, no brother, no sister, no, no cousin, no enemy, no one? Just living all by yourself in a world and you are the only one that exists? Would you go on vacation alone? How fun would that be? Going to bed every night all by yourself. Nobody else there. Not because you chose to be alone, but because that is how it is. No one. It tells us in Genesis that it's not good for man to be alone. We weren't created to be alone. We were created to be in union with each other. We, we are a social creature. 
And our relationships are healthy and our relationships are necessary. Our relationship with your wife should be one of the most valuable things you have. Your relationship with your husband right now should be one of the most valuable things you have. Stop worrying about if you didn't put the seat down. Stop worrying about the toothpaste cover not being put off. Stop, stop, because that person has been given to you as a gift and is irreplaceable. And not just your wife. What about your children and your, your brothers and your sisters? To have a spouse, to have a brother, to have a sibling that is there, that is coming from the same genes as the same blood that you're related to. Those are important things. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I understand we fight. I understand we bicker. I understand that, you, you know, he's touching me. He's touching me. Tell them to leave me alone. Tell it. I, I understand that we have that issue. But if we don't stop and realize how awesome it is to have it and where it came from, we start losing its value. And then what about the kingdom of God? What about the most important thing in the world that he has provided and provided access to his kingdom? The ability to be his child. The ability to be called his very own. To be the ability to be his dependent, to be in a kingdom that will never end, where he rules and he reigns. We go over this all the time because isn't that what we're waiting on as believers in Christ? Aren't we waiting on a trumpet to sound? Aren't we waiting on the new kingdom to come where there's no pain, there's no sickness, there's no heartache? We're not living for this world. Please stop living for this world because this world is going to pass. We need to start living for the world that's going to be here forever and that is the kingdom of God. And God has not only provided the kingdom, he's provided access to the kingdom through Jesus Christ and has said, I'm pleased to give it to you. And sometimes we miss out on the kingdom and sometimes we miss out on the blessings of our relationship because we're so focused on the stuff. And we miss out on what's really important in life. Isn't that what's happening here in this scripture? Here you have this, this man this brother, Jesus is preaching to thousands of people. Go to verse 1. There were over thousands, it says thousands of people he's talking to about some serious stuff. About the yeast of the Pharisees and about denying him and being denied before the Father. Heavy duty stuff. And out of nowhere, this man stands up and says, in front of everybody, can you tell my brother to divide his the inheritance with me? Talk about being disconnected from what's really important. Can you imagine standing here right now? The, the, no shame. Put yourself in the story. Don't just read them as words. There are thousands of people standing there. Jesus is preaching, and he's concerned about an inheritance. That's all he cares about. And he's missing out on what Jesus is really talking about. And he's looking out about the importance of the things. And Jesus is like, why are you asking? What? Come on, all you Sunday school teachers have been there, haven't you? been teaching a class and you're all into it and you're like here and then you get this answer and you I don't know what you what <laughs> so Jesus begins to you know to rebuke him and tell him what the real issue is and that was his greed he wasn't happy with what he had he needed more how much is enough how much more do we need we always want more don't we don't say you don't, because you do. You always want. You win one million, it wasn't enough. Two million would have got me this. Oh, I won 10 million. Yeah, but the taxes was 80 for 60%. So I only ended up with this much money. And if I had this much, I could have. How much is enough? How big is enough? How many shirts do we need? How many pants do we need? How many televisions do we need? How much is enough? So Jesus points it right out. He says, hey, be on your guard about greed, man. Greed's a problem. Basically, what he pointed out to him, that he's in violation of commandment number 10. Thou shalt not covet. Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's donkey. Don't covet your neighbor's wife. Meaning, don't want something that's not yours. Be content with what God has given you. And he was having a hard time with that. Because his brother just got a whole bunch and, and he doesn't give it to me. And what about the brother, the older brother, not wanting to share it with his, his younger? Both of them were being greedy. And we've seen that. 
How many people know of brothers and sisters that don't talk anymore, husbands and wives that fighting over money, fighting over the house, fighting over stuff? Business partners, broken, close friends, went into business together. Now they hate each other because they, 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 can't, they can't be content. I need more, and you have more, and I need it. And there's a problem, and Jesus is kind of dealing with that, because each one of them have already been blessed beyond measure. It isn't like they're poor. It isn't like the, the young brother who was asking for the inheritance didn't eat in three, four days, and, and his brother had the ability to help him, and, and he's not doing it. They both had. They just weren't comfortable with what they already had. And they needed to have more and more and more and more. There's a problem. Because they forgot how important their relationship was. He was trying to let him know your relationship with your brother is more important than the money. So either let him keep it all or share it all. Do something. But you guys... Are... And they couldn't figure it out in front of thousands of people. Think about what was on his heart. That's what was on his head. He couldn't even hear what Jesus was saying. People sometimes come into church with so much on your mind and, and so much on your heart and so much going on. And I get it because I've been there and you can't hear anything that's coming out of my mouth because you're so caught up with... with... Ah. And Jesus says, you know what? Let me tell you a story. Let me help you out. I'm going to tell you a story about this rich man. This rich man, he had a crop and it was an abundance of crop. So much that he had nowhere to put it. So he took down the barns that he already had full of crop, and he made big, bigger ones. Put him in there and said, man, I'm, I'm good now. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to relax. I'm going to be merry. I'm going to enjoy life because God, because look, look what I got. And then God shows up and calls him a fool. He says, you foolish. You, you fool. You, you, your life is going to be taken from you. And what's going to happen with all your stuff? And I'm worrying, and I'm wondering, why did he call him foolish? What was so foolish about the man in the parable? We know what was foolish about the brother. He was more worried about stuff than his relationship and the kingdom. He wasn't worried about the kingdom because he was breaking the rules of the kingdom. You see, the kingdom of God is coming, but the kingdom of God is already here. And the kingdom of God is here when we begin to act and follow the laws that govern the kingdom. Every kingdom has laws. Every kingdom have rule, has rules. They all do. The kingdom of God has them. And you know what they are? The commandments of God. Those are the rules. That's, that's how the kingdom of God functions. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not you know, bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This is, you read Matthew chapter 5. If you've been in Bible study on Wednesday, we've been sharing the rules of the kingdom. Someone strikes you on the left cheek, bat. Turn to him the right cheek. He shares the rules of the kingdom. We know the laws. And when we're following them, the kingdom of God is a reality in our life at that moment. I know we live in 2021 and we think grace is so big that God's kingdom has no law. God's kingdom has no It's anything goes in the kingdom of God day. Think about that. When people say, you no, know, you do what you want. It's grace. Yeah, God's forgiving, but there is still a standard of living, and one of them is thou shalt not covet, and he was coveting, which means he was pulling himself outside the kingdom of God. He was breaking the laws of it. So now he wants to show them something deeper, and he tells them this story about this rich man who just got called a fool. Why? You're worried about relation. You're, you're not worried about your relationships, and you're not worried about the kingdom, and you're a fool because you're not worried about God. He was foolish for a lot of reasons. He was foolish because he wasn't rich to a God. Doesn't he say that? He says it in verse 21. He says, you aren't rich towards God. You didn't take God into account. But one of the things that we must do as believers in Christ is think about God all the time. We need to take into account God in everything we do. Every purchase, every time we spend, everything we have on a daily basis. Why did he give it to me? Why do I have a lot? Why do I have so much? Did he give it just for me? Is it really just for my comforts? Is that it? I don't know. What do you think? 
I think it's important that we stop and we think for a moment and think about what God has to say. So one, he wasn't rich toward God because he wasn't considering what God might want. He see it in verse 17. He says he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. He just saw it as his. And we understand what is believers in Christ. Everything that you have is whose? God's. Everything. Your house, your clothes, your food, your refrigerator, your pillow, your bed. It's all his because he all gave it to you. And when you get it, if you don't stop for a second and say, not only I want to be thankful that you had it, why did you give it to me? Is there, is there a reason why I have this? Is it for me to put it in the bank? Is it for me to store up and just, just pile it up, just pile it up, pile it up for a rainy day? Understand, this man was already rich. It starts out, a rich man had a big crop. So he was a guy that already had his needs being met. And somehow he gets this overabundance of blessing. And he didn't think about anybody else. He only thought about himself. He didn't think about God. He didn't wonder where it came from. And he didn't think about people that were around him. It was only about his pleasure. It's what we call hedonism. The man was a hedonist. A hedonist is someone who pursues pleasure. Anyone who pursues pleasure is a hedonist. We live in a country where one of our values is hedonism. What is one of our values? The, the right to happiness at all. The right to pursue happiness. That as an American citizen, we have the right in this kingdom of the United States, we have the right to be a hedon. We have the right to pursue happiness. And aren't we glad as, 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 as American citizens, we have the right to pursue happiness? But the kingdom of God is different. We don't pursue happiness in the kingdom of God. We pursue holiness in the kingdom of God. As believers and followers of Yahweh, our pursuit is in pleasure. Our pursuit is holiness. Our pursuit is Christ. Our pursuit is the kingdom of God. Our pursuit is God's will. Our pursuit is God's way. Our pursuit is Him. Not happiness. And here's the thing. You can't pursue both of them at the same time. It's one or the other. And what makes God good, as you pursue Him, He'll give you what you need and you'll find your happiness. But if you pursue your happiness and not pursue Him, you might just end up unhappy one day. Because another thing he missed out on was the fact that he wasn't going to live forever. And one day he was going to stand before the man and he was going to stand before the judge and he missed it. And one day every one of us in here will also stand and give an account for our lives and everything that we did with the stuff that we've been given. And I don't think it's wrong to have stuff. The rich man had stuff. I have stuff. You have stuff. But are we remembering God in the stuff? Are we... Thinking it's only ours? Is it just for me? Always take into account God. Always take into account holiness and the kingdom of God. Because he says what? Seek first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness. When he says it's righteousness, that means the rules. <laughs> Seek the kingdom and all the rules that make the kingdom thrive. And one of the main rules is what? Be holy. For well, the Lord thy God is, is holy. And without holiness, nobody's going to see the Lord. So you got the big house, you got the nice car, you got all the stuff, and you got no holiness, and you're bumming on the day of judgment. You, you, can, you, you, there's not, you have nothing. So he's trying to help these two people understand that. that hey, listen, if your brother doesn't want to share with you, just, just let it go. I got you. Don't cover. And then this guy, don't be greedy. Share what you have. Make sure holiness is your goal. And that should be the same for us with the stuff that we have and the life that we live. So, let me see if I can close this or begin to start wrapping it up. What are we supposed to do? Does, what, is that, what does that mean to you and I? We know what it means to those two boys, right? We, we, we see where their struggle is. What is ours? Do we fit in this story anywhere? You know, are you the younger brother? I don't know. Are you the older brother? I don't know. But Jesus does give us some practical application to his goodness. He starts with one. 
Don't be afraid. Stop worrying about your life. Stop worrying about your stuff. He says that. He says, therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. Because life is more than your stuff. So we as believers, stop worrying. If you're worried, please, today, stop. Make a decision today. God, I've looked at everything you've already given me, and you've already proven to me your willingness to give me the stuff and the kingdom. So I'm going to stop worrying about it, and I'm going to, I'm going to trust in you. I'm not going to hoard it. I'm not going to hold on to it. I, I don't need $2 million in my bank account. I just don't need it. <laughs> I get carried away. Sorry, Beverly. I get it. <laughs> he says, don't be afraid. Stop being afraid. I know it's easier said than done, isn't it? Come on now. There's a whole lot easier said than done. But if you could at least count your blessings, if you could at least realize and look back and say, man, he's got me through this, and he's provided me for this, and he's provided me for that, he's going to provide me for this, just make sure that you're not asking for something over and above what you actually really need. Remember, God's not broke. He's not done. <laughs> He hasn't run out. Now, if he ran out, then we all need to be afraid because he's got nothing to give tomorrow. We need to hold on. But God owns it all. He's just going to pour out some stuff. Another way of saying that, he's not done giving to any one of us. No reason to worry. No reason to be afraid. And two, he says to be rich towards him. Be generous. What he's saying, Jesus, in this, in, this, in this parable is God has been so generous to you, now you need to in turn stop worrying, stop being afraid, and start giving it away. And start using it for the kingdom of God. Stop, st start storing up treasures in heaven. He tells us that in verse 33. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. But no, he meant everybody else. I'm sorry, all the, those people. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourself that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where no thief comes near and no morph destroys. He's saying, you know, you, you, we are your values. Make sure that you're generous with what you have. There are people in need. He didn't give you all that for yourself. I really don't think he has. I, do you have to give it all the way? Please don't leave here thinking that the pastor says I need to give it all the way. That's between you and God. But if you're not giving any of it away, come on, guys, start, start, make a shift. Now, don't get me wrong. I know so many generous people in here. So this was hard to put together because this has got to be one of the most generous rooms that I've ever been in. Generous, 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 above and beyond. Generous, 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 but continue to be generous Continue, don't, don't be afraid. How about this? Don't be afraid to be generous. How about that? Don't be afraid to, to, to give it. Because what we're focusing on when we do is the fact that there's a kingdom coming and a kingdom that I'm a part of, and that's what's more important to me. I want to invest in the kingdom of God. That's what he means by store up treasures for yourself. I want to invest in this. Because this is the only thing that's eternal, isn't it? It's the only thing that's going to last forever. Has anyone ever gotten robbed before? Anyone? It stinks when someone comes and takes your stuff. And he says, you do this, no one's robbing that. That's eternal. That's going to be there forever. Everything wears out and rots away. But this stuff is eternal. And God has been good. So sell your possessions. Give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted. Where no thief comes no near and no moth destroys. Because where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So I guess, when it's all said and done, God has been good. God has been good. We have more than enough. We have more than we need. Now let's remember where it came from and remember to be generous back to him and don't be afraid. I say don't be afraid because for all of us people that have broken that gener gen generous bar barrier in our life, 
Because we know what it was like before we were generous. It was scary, wasn't it? If I give this away, then I might not have... If I do this, then I might not... So you'd be afraid. But I've learned God is a better giver than I am. God has so much more than I do. God, God, I, I, you, you cannot, you cannot outgive God. I, I want to sit here, dare you to do so. I dare everybody in here to start living a life where you can start outgiving Him. And let me see how, let me, let me see how that turns out for you. God is a giver, a give, and it shall be given good measure, shaken together, will be poured into your life. Because with the measure that you use, will will be measured right back unto you. Oh my, how awesome is that? So be generous this morning. Seek first His kingdom. Seek first His righteousness. Seek first His will. Seek first His way. And don't worry. Don't worry. Because He's got you. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this morning and this time together. I thank you for your grace and your mercy and your, your never-ending love. You are good. You are amazing. You have done so much for us, and we sometimes do so little back for you. But help this be a two-way street. Help us not just to receive, but help us to be generous, to give back to you to demonstrate our confidence, to demonstrate our willingness and our understanding to know that it all comes from you. I love you, Lord. I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name. Man, God is good. All the time. Come on, one more time. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. I just thank you guys for being who we are. Thank you for letting me come up here each week and just share what I believe God is, has for us. Be generous. Be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful. Be thankful. That's what generosity is. Generosity is being thankful. It's demonstrating we know where it came from. And it's demonstrating that we know He's not done. Father God, thank You for this morning. Thank You for Your grace and mercy. Thank You for Jesus Christ. Thank you for his blood that washed us. Just thank you. For you are good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a blessed Sunday. God bless you.